everyone to today's webinar with the American Society of the University of Haifa. My name is Naomi Reinhartz. I am the Chief Executive Officer of ASUH. I'm calling in from Miami. Um, I really appreciate all of you who are joining us for today's webinar. We're having these webinars now every two weeks or so, ever since October 7th, and we'll continue to do so um, as long as our audience um, seeks our content. Um, today, I'll be speaking with renowned cyber terrorism expert, Dr. Gabrielle Weinman of University of Haifa, and together we will explore the ongoing discourse surrounding Israel's war with Hamas, the, the misinformation that's being shared literally minute by minute each day across social media, and how Israel and we can alter the narrative. Uh, I want to say that this webinar is being co-sponsored by Rabbi Arthur Wiener and the JCC of Paramus in New Jersey. Um, who's with Congregation uh, Beth Tikva, and we're very grateful for their partnership and support of us. Um, Dr. Weinman is a professor of communications at the University of Haifa, and he's a former fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He is known for having begun to track and study terrorist websites all the way back in the mid-1990s, about 30 years ago, long before most analysts were even aware of this problem. He's written nine books. He's written many papers and research reports, They've been published in scientific journals, and he's received numerous international grants and awards for his work. Dr. Weinman has also been a visiting professor at various universities, including University of Pennsylvania, which has been in the news a lot recently, um, Stanford University, Hofstra, American University, DC, University of Maryland, the University of Munich in Germany, Carleton University in Canada, and the National University of Singapore. Uh, with social networks now a flurry of misinformation and harrowing images since the October 7th terrorist attacks and the outbreak of war with Hamas, um, and mainstream news outlets are voicing sometimes even solidarity with Gaza or with Hamas and critical of Israel um, and what the IDF has been doing, Dr. Weinman will be providing a timely discussion on where Israel can go from here in this unprecedented, unprecedented PR battle. Um, before we start, I want to also take this opportunity to quickly update you on the efforts that we at University of Haifa are doing to try to fortify and support both the home front and the front lines um, during this very difficult time in Israel. Currently at University of Haifa, we have over a thousand students and 50 faculty members who are in the reserves, including 300 students who are in the security forces. As part of our scholarship fund for reserve soldiers, we've provided emergency scholarships of $500 each to every one of our student soldiers who very much need our support at this time, who are serving and defending the Jewish state. Uh, we've also been able to raise uh, over $500,000, which I'm very proud of, to purchase equipment for our brave soldiers on the front lines, including $290,000 for 20 cutting edge portable ultrasound devices for frontline MASH hospital units um, and $210,000 for 200 bulletproof ceramic vests. Also, as part of our emergency fund, we currently have around 150 people, including 50 children, who are staying in our dorms. Um, our dorms have been empty since October 7th, as we can't start classes again until we have most of our students and faculty back from the reserves. So we're allowing hundreds of people to use our dorms um, as a temporary residence. Um, these people have been evacuated from across Israel, from war zones in the south, um, and really throughout the country. Um, lastly, our fund is also providing relief to displaced families through living stipends, psychological and emotional support, um, and more. So if anyone would like to continue to contribute to these meaningful funds, we still need your support. You can visit us at ASUH.org slash donate, and we'll put that information in the chat as well. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Gabriel Weinman um, to our listeners and viewers today. Um, we have a dedicated Q&A section. Um, at the end of this webinar, so please start putting your questions in the Q&A section on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Um, and again, please put your name and where you're calling in from and your connection to us in the chat. So <laughs> um, let's begin our conversation. So Dr. Weinman, thank you again for, for joining us. It's a pleasure to see you. I know obviously you've got a lot going on over there, so we appreciate you taking um, your time with us today. Um, why don't we begin by, if you can share with us, how is Israel, in your opinion, faring overall in its handling of the war from a PR perspective? A lot of people are saying there's two wars right now, the actual physical war on the front lines and the PR war, which really does feel like a war, being that I'm 
everything that I'm seeing on social media today. So um, what are the overall um, ways that Israel is handling this PR war? What are the themes that Israel and perhaps the government and the IDF are trying to convey to everyone around the world? And do you believe that Israel is successful or not? Thank you for having me again. Um, the title you gave to my lecture in a way is misleading because the title was uh, Why is Hamas winning the PR war? And let me argue that I'm not that sure there is an, any winner. And basically the question is, could Israel want, win this kind of war at all? And I will argue and try to convince you that we are facing a combination of factors that makes it almost, almost impossible to win the PR war. We are always on the losing side, some of it due to our own blame, and we can blame, be blamed for it, and I'll explain it. And some of it is certainly factors that are beyond um, our power. First about the Jewish way, let's blame ourselves first. Uh, I think Israel doesn't or did not consider the PR battle as important as the real battle. I think there were too many agencies in Israel. I can count 10, I won't list them now, we won't have the time. 10 different agencies that deal with Hasbara and propaganda and psychological warfare and PR. They are not coordinated. They are not uh, very often, it's a waste of effort and energy and money and sources. And yet, I think we are not doing that bad compared to previous campaigns. It's a question of time. On the 7th of October and on the 8th of October, October, we were the winners on the PR battlefield. We were portrayed as the victims, as the poor ones, as the bleeding nation. When we started hitting back, things changed. And all of a sudden, instead of being the poor David, we became the powerful Goliath as always. I think there is also a change right now. I think this is a moving, uh, dynamic battlefield in which images change and uh, the two sides in a very cynical way. I mean, this is propaganda way, uh, war. And propaganda wars are always change, uh, are very cynical. But I think that uh, in many ways, we do have more success than in the past. And the reason for that, compared to other campaigns Israel was involved in, is that Israel is now willing unlike in the, in the past, to show the victims, to bring media people to the scenes, to expose our killed ones, burned babies, raped women, burning houses. We didn't do it in the past. In many ways, I think Israel is now fighting better than it did before. We still have a long way to go, but there are some achievements in the PR battle. How do you define an achievement? That's a good question, because um, when we speak about campaigns like that, there are different target audiences. You, are, you have your own Israeli back front. You have to talk to your people and convince them to raise the morale and so on. You have the international public opinion. You have the Jewish community all over the world, and you have the enemy. And sometimes messages sent to different audiences like that are conflicting. To your own audience, uh, you may be willing to share the, uh, a powerful image. We will win. We are the strong, strong ones. Don't worry. Maybe to the international uh, audiences, you would like to see also victimization of your people to show that you are not always that strong. Uh, so Israel and, and Hamas are exchanging uh, blows, I mean, propaganda blows. And, and it's very hard to measure who is winning. Uh, when the Hamas decided to show the attacks, and uh, I think in many, in, in a very gruesome way, showed what they did, and it was shown all over the world, it backfired to Hamas. And people all over the world reacted emotionally, as they should. 
to what Hamas terrorists did to Israel and to citizens and to all people. And yet, Hamas did broadcast and upload it to social media because they were considering them the back people there in Gaza, the people from Gaza that they wanted to convince their own fighters, their own supporters, Arabs in Arab countries, and say, you see, we are winning. Look what we did. Here's our revenge. So success depends, as they say, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So is success in propaganda warfare. Thank you for that. Um, one thing that's different in this war that I've never seen um, in prior wars is obviously the proliferation of TikTok, um, which a lot of countries are talking about banning, including some members of our own country and our own government. Um, there's so much information uh, and misinformation that's being shared across TikTok as well as other platforms. So TikTok is the one that's um, really catered to young, young people. And a lot of younger generations are more sort of anti-Israel than the older generations. Um, so even when Israel is sharing powerful images that prove the brutality of Hamas, or even when Hamas shares its own videos that prove their own brutality, a lot of people, for some reason, don't believe it. You know, they believe what they want to believe. Their algorithm is showing them what they want to see. Um, so when there's so much false narrative being, being shown across these dangerous platforms, how can one win a PR against lies? Um, it, it seems very difficult. <laughs> I've been studying social media since they emerged in 2014. I've been doing some studies on hate on TikTok. Some of our studies were on racism, far-right extremism, neo-Nazism, and anti-Semitism on TikTok. So we are quite aware of the power of social media. And as you said, social media became an important factor in PR. And this is new for this campaign, for this war. The, the importance of social media. Uh, why social media? Because many people, especially the younger generations, consume all the news and interpretation of the news from social media. There are many studies done on, for example, on US students. Most of the information they get is not from leading networks, TV networks, from newspapers or radio news broadcast. They get it from social media. And more than just social media, they get it from uh, new social media, from young social media, from the new social media, like TikTok, uh, YouTube, and so on. Um, one more factor do we have to consider about social media, an important one, besides the issue of uh, global reach and exposure among young people, is the idea of no censorship and no control and no regulation. No, but there are no editors there. You can publish whatever you want. The Zuckerbergs of the world, of this world, or the Elon Musk, don't, they don't really interfere. They don't want to. They don't uh, want to spend resources in censoring or regulating their platforms. So these are, in a way, <clears throat> channels that are open to all, and everybody can upload and share whatever he wants. As a result, what we see there is material of I would label it as disinformation and fake news in a way that we never saw before. Now, it's not new. We saw it in the US, uh, related to the um, political division in the US and to the political campaigns in the US. And we see it now in, in the war in Israel. The problem is that uh, Hamas, a very sophisticated organization, I've been tracing the online presence since 1998. So we are really long time there, 25 years. And this is a well-experienced organization, media-wise. They know how to use the internet and they know how to use social media. And they spread news there without being, uh, I mean, even considering the issue of censoring or checking facts and so on. Israel is on the weaker side here because as a state, Israel cannot afford lies, cannot afford misinformation. Uh, so in the night when the Palestinians spoke about thousands of people killed in the hospital, which never happened, and it was spreading all over the media, especially um, online media, but also leading newspapers in the States, citing uh, Hamas disinformation campaign, the Israelis checked the fact. It took them hours to find out the real, what really happened there. And it was a missile launched by 
a Palestinian faction in the Gaza Strip and not by the Israelis. But still, the Israelis had to wait, check the fact, and present the presentation. So it's not easy to fight in that in this arena. However, and again, some light, some positive aspect. The Israelis are well aware of, of the importance of social media, uh, and we are fighting them. And when I said we, I don't mean the government, I mean the Israeli citizens. Uh, in many ways, the Israeli people took some of the roles that should have been uh, fulfilled by the government and are doing it themselves. And I see many groups, including my students, involved in launching uh, a counter campaign, presenting our narrative, presenting our facts, trying to show how false the Hamas campaign is. So it is a, an important arena, and I think the Israelis are present there and active there. Thank you. Um, why, why do you think it is that more and more people are using social media to get their news instead of mainstream media? I don't know if you have the numbers of sort of the decline of viewership of mainstream media channels like CNN, et cetera, versus people going to social media to get their news. I, I'm just curious what the numbers are and why, why you think that trend is continuing. Well, I don't need numbers. I can tell you that each time I was teaching in several American universities, and I asked the students if they get the news from newspapers, no, from radio, no. Are you watching TV news? Barely. So where do you get your news from? Social media. And it's not just a surfing around. Uh, very often it's somebody sharing with others. So you have a social networks diffusing uh, social items. And I think this is what's happening now. And in many ways, it's, it's a troubling fact because some of those social media, as I said, uh, eager to publish everything and quickly. And the more dramatic, uh, bloody pictures, gruesome pictures, videos of execution, of, of attacks, um, unbased facts, all of these can be spread on social media without anybody checking it, limiting it, or uh, preventing it from being there. So social media, especially among young generation, and especially the new ones, you mentioned TikTok, uh, are so crucial in, in creating uh, images and spreading narratives and so on. Yeah. Um, th there's a question in, in the chat that I, I want to bring up now that I, I have myself is, what is, is there a way to sort of track what messages are the best for Israel to share? I mean, you see a lot of sort of pro-Palestinian or, you know, or sometimes pro-Hamas people um, sharing, you know, these images of Gazan children being killed and and families crying and and these sort of destroyed parts of Gaza. What what images should should Israelis and pro-Israel people be sharing that will pull at the heartstrings of people in the same way? Okay, first of all, it's an excellent question, and I I really thank the participant, the viewer, uh, who posted this question on the chat. Uh, the question: How to test? A success is very important, even these days. And I must tell you that um, I guess it won't surprise you that we are doing research right now during the war on, on campaigns and the success or the relative success of different campaign, uh, different messages and postings and so on. Now, there are many ways to check, to measure online success. Uh, first, you, look, you can look at the number of people watching it, views. You can look at some of the people, how many people comment on it, react to it, how many people share it, how many people like it. Uh, all these measures combined are creating some scale of success. Um, uh, since we activate students to, in our uh, war rooms, digital war rooms, where students sit down and actually react to messages, post messages, and so on, we check the success. And I can give you some brief um, review of some of the findings. One of the first uh, uh, messages that we sent out and was a huge success in terms of views. I can tell you that only on TikTok, we had over 5 million views immediately, was the uh, connection made between Hamas and ISIS. Hamas is ISIS was a, a relatively very successful message. First, because it's true. If you go back, if you go back to the history of Hamas, if you go back to Wahhabism, I won't speak about the roots of jihad and so on, 
but it's the same message. These are the same ideology. This is the extreme jihad. It comes from the same sources, from the same parents, if you want. So they are the same. And more than that, uh, emotionally speaking, and since we are not just rational when we speak about propaganda and PR, it brings up the hostility towards ISIS. So it was one campaign that was very successful. Another one that we saw a uh, very positive impact was videos that we posted with the picture of the children taken as hostages. I mean, taking a, a baby of eight months, a baby eight months old as a captive, as a hostage in a war uh, and, and presenting, I know it sounds cynical, but this, this is a cynical war. The PR war, the image war, the narrative war is a cynical one. Each side brings his victims, each side um, exposes the wounds and the bleeding wounds. And I think uh, Israel did it too and should do it because we were victimized by a terrorist group. And I think some of the messages sent out yielded, I would say, the impact, the desired impact in terms of exposure, sharing, and even positive sentiments, people commenting on our videos. Yeah. For sure. I mean, it's hard not to have a reaction when you see those images coming from Israel. Um, another issue in terms of lies and misinformation, of course, is some of the unfortunate and grave errors that you've seen mainstream media make, for instance, with the hospital, you know, alleged um, bombing that obviously turned out not to be a hospital, not to be 500 people, not to be Israel's fault. Um, often the mainstream media might issue a correction, but it stays later. It's in small print. It's, you know, most people don't notice it. By then the damage is done and a lot of people don't even remove the original you know mistake from their um platforms um why is this now sort of a common practice why is the mainstream media getting it wrong do they do they have bad sources are they ignoring the right sources you know and are there any you know real sources um coming from gaza when you know the gaza health ministry or you know these supposed independent um bodies are really under the sort of control of Hamas? In my opening statement, I said that uh, the basic question is, can Israel win at all such a PR campaign? And I said there is a coalition of factors challenging the Israeli campaigns and the Israeli narrative. And I think the case of the so-called mainstream media, which is the Western mainstream media and the bias against Israel, which is very clear, what was clear from the first day. Um, why are they biased? And I think it's a combination of factors that are playing against us. And one of them is the double standard. I mean, we expect more from you, the Israelis, Western, democratic, liberal, advanced, modern nation, than we expect from a bunch of uh, terrorists in, in Gaza Street. The second is the reverse image. Uh, it's not that we just expect more of you, but you are not the David. You are the Goliath now, Israel. You are the most powerful nation in the Middle East. You have the strongest army, and the poor victims are now the Palestinians. So a couple of days after, after the horrible attack on 7th of October, uh, the image of Israel as, a, as a, the victims, as the victim country was replaced by the poor Palestinians being attacked by Israel as a revenge. So we have a reverse uh, narrative of David and Goliath imagery. Then we have the old anti-Semitism that plays a role there. Uh, because sometimes you, you really wonder what makes them accept the Hamas messages and disinformation so easily. Uh, the BBC, for example, the respectful uh, broadcasting agency that keeps professional standards will never la label Hamas as terrorists. They use all words, militants and so on. So when the spokesman for, and, and by the way, they are defined by the British law as a terrorist organization. There's no question about it. So when the BBC spokesperson was asked about it, how come you don't call them terrorists? He said, well, terrorism is a loaded word. Well, of course it is. Uh, how could you, how would you, label somebody who's killing babies, kidnapping women, um, killing innocent uh, citizens, burning down houses, uh, and doing raping women. 
what does it take for you to make something be labeled with the loaded word terrorism? By the way, IRA did to British citizens less than Hamas did on 7th of October when we were always IRA people, Irish uh, Republican Army terrorists, we were always lab labeled terrorists. So there's also the, the, the issue of, of uh, anti-Semitism, the old anti-Semitism combined with the new one, the new anti-Semitism, blaming Israel for being, becoming a, a militant um, uh, and colonialist country. And finally, we have to consider the, uh, the enemy. We never spoke about the enemy, but the enemy is smart enough to, uh, I, would, I would say, to challenge us. Hamas is a very media-wise terrorist organization, as I said, well experienced in doing it, and are very resourceful. Don't forget that when they attacked on the 7th of October, most of the attackers had cameras on the helmets and were videotaping and were mainstreaming it live. And they brought with them the so-called journalists. Those are freelancers, stringers, usually Palestinians, who are not journalists at all. They are paid by, by, by the minute they can um, sell of videos. So they were just representing, and shamefully, representing uh, American media, presented them as, as uh, uh, journalists. They're certainly not professional journalists, but they were able to send pictures uh, as Hamas wanted. The Western media were never telling anyone that these are not journalists, these are not professional uh, people, and these are usually Palestinians who are just free stringers. So you have a combination, combination of factors that explain why the Western media are so tough to convince that they are biased against us. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us were shocked when we saw those people wearing the press, you know, a vest going on the motorcycles with the Hamas terrorists on October right. 7th. And I, you know, I, I did hear at least one of them was was let go from his contract. I'm not sure about if if others were as well. But, um, you know, that was pretty shocking for a lot of us. Um, you also see, you know, given that, as you said, Hamas war. Um, cameras in this attack, which is also very unusual, I think, for any terrorist attack that we've seen in our lifetimes. Um, you also see now some schools um, telling parents not to let their children go onto Telegram and TikTok um, as Hamas is potentially releasing these difficult images of the horrific attacks. Um, on the other hand, you see now the IDF doing screenings of, you know, the 47 minutes footage um, around the country, to, you know, including at Harvard and and a lot of consulates and up and you know Gal Gadot doing a screening. Do you, what do you think of these sort of public screenings for press, for leaders, uh, for government officials? Do you think that's a good thing? Do you think people should be viewing that um, to try to prove Israel, you know, that Israel is telling the truth of what happened? I certainly think that this is an excellent move, and for the first time, I think uh, the Israeli Hasbara should be praised uh, for doing. Uh, these activities. In the past, we, we kept our sorrows, our bleeding, our victims to ourselves. I think that uh, the willingness to expose um, the victimization of Israel is important. We are not really that powerful Goliath, as it was proved on 7th of October. And we need to, to acknowledge that. And we need to, not, to let the people in the world know about it what happened on the 7th. Now, again, if, if we don't do it, it will always be the Hamas who will do it. Don't forget that Hamas is wise enough not only to broadcast and upload to online platforms those horrible images of the attacks, but also trying to balance it, especially when transmitting messages to the Western world, how uh, nice and kind they are to the hostages. And they released hostages. They were stroking the, the head of a, a frightened child that was released. They tried to help. They, they pretended to be very human, bringing bottles of water to the, to the victims they released. These are the people that killed the brothers and the sisters and the parents of those victims, and the neighbors of them. And yet Hamas is, is speaking different languages, different, I would say, visual uh, languages, when trying to... Uh, target different audiences. 
So uh, the message of they are sending now, we are the Palestinians are the victims. The, the Israelis are the powerful Goliath victimizing us. Um, they destroyed Gaza. We, we are innocent. And we are more than that. We are very human. We, we treat nicely uh, those hostages. And if they are killed, and it was the, the fault of the Israeli attacks. So if we leave the stage only for them, we will lose the war. So the Israelis should do what they do. And they should show the pictures of the hostages. They should tell the story, the personal stories of those famous families, those two uh, young redheads that the Hamas announced their death the two brothers, brother and sister, held by the Hamas. Uh, yes, we should fight back. And in the same way, the PR campaigns like that should be fought. Yeah. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, especially after seeing the reactions and hearing the reactions of those who watched the footage, you know, especially the non-Jewish um, viewers. And, you know, you can see the transformation of of their th views of Israel before and after the 47 minutes. Um, so thank you for that answer. Um, another bizarre trend we're seeing with the young generation um, is this sort of fascination now with terrorist leaders like you saw this bizarre viral um <laughs> video of of this woman praising osama bin laden and then people reading his letter to america and posting online that was later taken down but i mean it shows the dangers of of social media if people are starting to praise and revere terrorists um everything just seems a little bit backwards do you think things like that should be monitored should be restricted how do you prevents viral videos like that going going on our social media, you know, praising terrorists and terrorism. Yeah, I think it's quite shocking to see American citizens praising bin Laden, uh, trying to say that uh, bin Laden was right. Uh, the man who was responsible for the killing of 3,000 Americans, actually more than that, and many others, the man who was responsible for killing more Arabs than any any time Israel in all the campaigns and all the wars did. Uh, bin Laden, who was a master murderer, is now being presented in some of the social media as somebody who should be understood, um, maybe he was just and so. How can we explain that? Well, I think it's a again, a combination of factors. One of my colleagues um, called it, um, some of those people, as the useful idiots, meaning that they are completely ignorant they don't, certainly don't know about the history of jihad, about the history of radical Islam, about Wahhabism, about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, most of them never read, I think, the declaration of Hamas. Hamas is not aiming just to destroy Israel. Let's look at the um, declaration, the treaties of Hamas. They, they are fighting to rule the world. They want to bring Sharia rule to the world. It's not just Israel and, and the Jews um, in Israel. Um, but most of those people are certainly, uh, I would say, victims of ignorance. And more than that, it seems like to be trendy. It, it's like the fashionable way. Well, why don't we support the poor Palestinians who fight for, uh, for independence? Why shouldn't we support the, the weak side? Well, are they really the weak side? If you look at Israel, tiny Israel in the Middle East, who is the weak, who is the small, who is the tiny nation surrounded by Arab countries and millions of Arabs? But for some of those, as I would call them, instrumental, useful idiots, who don't have any idea, who don't even know the history of Islam, they don't even know uh, the interpret different interpretations that most Arabs are not violent, are not bin Ladens, and are not jihadists. But ignorance is one key. The second one is the social media. The ability to post whatever you want and without anybody censoring it, uh, regulating it, and so on. And that leads me to, to your final question, which was, so what can be done about it? I think there are two measures. Uh, for the first one, defensive and offensive. The defensive one is education. Once people know the facts, know the history, know the, the, know the maps, know geography, they know the, the terms used. They know what those people want. I think they don't will not be um, that easily seduced by, by um, messages online. The second, uh, the more uh, I would say, offensive measure 
is regulating social media. And this is a larger question than just the issue of the war between Israel and Hamas. I think social media became the social platform, the meeting place, uh, the, the leading of the social discourse, and the, source of in, the main source of information for uh, younger uh, people. And as such, they have responsibility. It's not just about making money. And the Elon Musk and the Zuckerbergs of the world should be aware that they are not there now only as people who owe um, who have a responsibility for the shareholders. They own public media. They own the, the market of ideas and they should control it, which means they have responsibility to eliminate racist information, postings that are disinformation, and so on. Can they do it themselves? I'm not sure. And quite, uh, and I wrote about it in my recent books, I think there should be a private um, and public um, actors combined, that is government and social agencies and social media combining efforts together and try to regulate the, the, the new, and it has to deal with so many aspects from pornography to abuse, sexual abuse, from um, uh, disinformation to um, wars and campaigns like that. Um, I think we, the social media grew up so fast in an unregulated way, and we never stopped and said, wait, we have also to minimize the damages, not just to join enjoy the benefits of the social media. Yeah. So how much regulation do you think there should be of both the media and the social media? You see a lot of reports that the New York Times is firing people who, you know, said pro-Nazi things and rehired them. You see that a lot of people alleging that there's bias among a lot of the journalists in media. You see, like I mentioned earlier, some countries trying to ban TikTok or other um, Telegram or other places that are unregulated. Um, you know, I don't think we can sort of examine the political ideologies of every every single individual, but is there some regulation that can be done? Yeah, I'm not speaking about political censorship. And I certainly don't want the Zuckerberg of the world to decide who is a terrorist and who is not, and what's a crime and not. Uh, but I think they can be guided and they can be assisted. And, and more than that, I think that it's quite easy to ask them for simple measures like, uh, if there is uh, information posted to identify the source, and if somebody wants to know who posted it, they should reveal the source. Because right now, people, you and me, we can post whatever we want. We can blame President Biden for whatever we want on social media, and our identity will be never exposed, even if we for, uh, spread false information. I think they should, and they are able to find and to locate and to give the identity of people who, who, um, who post such information. That will be one measure of, of, and I'm also speaking about the future. I think that right now the future media emerging, artificial intelligence, uh, we speak about metaverse, the combination of all online platforms together. I think that these are the future platforms. And why, right now when there are at the stage of design development, we should encourage the developers to consider measures that will protect those platforms from being abused. So we should encourage them even financially to invest when planning and launching new platforms in minimizing the uh, potential to abuse those platforms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have... Um about a hundred questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to try my best to combine them um, to you know, get as many as we can in, in the time allotted. Um, how do you see, see the significance of Elon Musk going to Israel? Obviously um, one of the richest men in the world and, and the owner of X. Um, do you think that Israel should do similar outreach to other heads of social media, PR, marketing companies? Um, should Zuckerberg go? Should, should everyone go to Israel right now and see what's going on? Because it seemed to affect Elon Musk. He started wearing the, you know, the hostages um, necklace and speaking publicly about Israel. Um, perhaps he was trying to repair his image. But um, what do you think about that? OK, two statesmen. Uh, second one will be personal. The first one. 
uh, more like from objective point of view, I think it's a, it's a, we should attempt to convince those operators and owners of social media and show them that they are responsible, uh, not just in the case of Israel, what happened on Capitol Hill on that horrible day when Americans, wild Americans, crazy American extremists attacked and killed people on Capitol Hill was partly the result of social media messages. And we studied that. And we have all the evidence how they incited people to come over with, uh, with weapons. Uh, so the attempt to convince them that they should be responsible and even to pressure them is understandable and I think the right move. But personally, speaking about Elon Musk, uh, it's very hard to understand this man in rational terms. His behavior is not quite rational. When I see what he did to Twitter, when I see the results in terms of the decline of Twitter, uh, I'm not always sure that he's the right person um, to convince with rational or humanistic um, motives. More than that, I remember that uh, some months ago, he was hosting um, our Prime Minister Netanyahu in California and promised him many promises. And yet, the Twitter posted messages and directed people to disinformation, to anti-Semitism, to hate of Israel, to violence, to incitement. By the way, not just in this case, we are studying uh, other terrorist groups all over the world, and jihadist group. Elon Musk is not doing what he promised uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. That time, I'm not sure he will keep his promise in the last, in the, the promises he made in the last visit right, right now in Israel. There's a lot of groups that I've personally followed for years, camera, honest reporting, memory, Others that try to monitor the media, they, in my opinion, they they do a lot of good by posting the lies and misinformation being spread by um, media companies and try to correct it, get, you know, get these corruption corrections published after the fact. Can you speak to all these organizations out there? There's obviously many advocacy organizations from AJC to ADL um, to others. Are any of them making a difference? Um, how do we, you know, they're... <laughs> Jews, Jews love to create organizations, as they say, right? Two Jews, three organizations. Um, are all these organizations making a difference? I think they're all in it for the right reason, but what's who's making the best difference? Well, I think some of the organizations you mentioned are doing great work. I sometimes um, work with them. You mentioned memory and others. Uh, they are certainly monitoring online postings of terrorist groups in the Middle East. They certainly help us to expose some of the disinformation, some of the false uh, videos. I mean, uh, when you see a video of uh, a poor child crying in the streets of Gaza, and later uh, some of those agencies revealed that these pictures were taken in Syria many years ago, and where these children were actually the victims of the Syrian president Assad when he attacked his own people. And are now reposted as pictures of people from Gaza. This is important to reveal the lies, to um, expose the liars, and to stop uh, posting it. Um, some of it uh, is really important because you see the attempts um, to spread this information. And you see, for example, uh, uh, a funeral where the dead people on the stretches the, all of a sudden move. And you, you realize that these are not dead people, despite the fact that they covered one of them is smoking. Now, all of these should be revealed, and those agencies do a great work by, by monitoring it. And more than that, they feed the information and spread it to other organizations, to other groups, to individuals, to news agencies, and to my students who later diffuse it on social platforms themselves. So this is a very important source of, I would say, informal, non-governmental agencies from ADL to memory, all of these, and there are many of them. And the more, the better. Yeah, a lot of people are asking in the chat, and I think a lot of us have the same question, with so many organizations and so many good people out there trying to correct all the lies and, and spread positive messages, who can sort of lead this sort of massive global effort? You know, a lot of people are talking about a, a global strategic plan for media and social media. Is there such a thing? Who can lead it? 
um, because there's so many different great attempts being done, but they're not, you know, they're not joined together. They're not comprehensive. And on top of that, what should the message overall be? Should it be that da that Israel is the David or Israel is the Goliath? What sort of is more effective um, in terms of PR? Well, first of all, it's really a global issue. Uh, we did a study on anti-Semitism online in many uh, social media. And what we found uh, was the coalition of hate. It was quite uh, shocking to find that those people who spread anti-Semitic material are also spreading racism, anti-Black, anti-women, anti-gay community. You see what we call coalition of hate. And I think social media uh, is now the host of those coalition, and some of them like Telegram or TikTok, that are not Western and are not controlled by Western owners, are really presenting a, a challenge to us. How can we uh, force them to do something? I mean, Zuckerberg at least is ours, and our advertising agencies can stop um, uh, financing those channels with the advertisement. But how about TikTok, which is Chinese, or Telegram, which is uh, owned by a Russian person, or right now, TamTam, -tam, new one that we did the study about, Russian again. So there is a, a need for a coalition of uh, counter forces, because it's not only the problem of hating Jews or hating Israelis, it's a problem of hate in general and uh, spreading hate on social media. Who should guide that? Well, I think the, uh, I mean, you would say the UN or something, but certainly um, I'm smiling and I know that most of my listeners probably smile together. You can't expect a biased agency or organization like UN controlled by by people who victimize democracy to fight the war of democracy. Um, so I think there should be some uh, coalition of nations who are uh, involved. And finally, uh, the question about David and Goliath, well, it depends who you are talking to. Again, uh, when we talk to Hamas and we try to convince Hamas to surrender, give up, and stop fighting, we certainly would like to be the Goliath. But when we speak to the Western world, and it's not contradictory. Um, we ought also to show that if we don't win this war, and if we don't stop uh, a stop to terrorism, this state will stop existing. 7th of October was just a scene, and it could be a nightmare if it could happen all over Israel. Um, it was just a sample of what they intend to do. And more than that, this is just Israel. With what Hamas has in mind, or other jihadi groups, when it comes to fighting the infidels, come, uh, fighting the West. And you realize that Israel is portrayed as the small devil, US and the West is the great devil. So it's not the problem of Israel and Jews only, it's a global problem. Mm -hmm. Another question I have personally is, where did, does the Arab world get their news? Is it mostly Al Jazeera, which you know has its own problems? Um, you know, the Arab world is is massive and, um, you know, the Palestinians are one thing, but it's really, you know, part of the larger Arab-Israeli war, in my opinion. So are they getting, you know, their news from any reliable sources? Yeah, the Arab population is a, a very important target group, especially if you consider the uh, Abraham codes, codes which, which brought some kind of, uh, I would say, uh, positive relationships between Israel and, and several Arab nations. So uh, when we consider Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia uh, and Dubai, the Emirates, we certainly uh, have messages, important messages to convey to them. I must say again, and this is in a way done under the radar, but the Israelis are spending some efforts on talking to Arab populations too. The campaign is not just towards Europe and the West or the Palestinians, it's also uh, directed to those uh, countries, including, by the way, believe it or not, the Iranian population. Uh, we are broadcasting to Iran in Iranian, trying to, to bring our narrative to the Iranian population as well. Um, so it is an important target group in a way, target population, a huge one. Um, and again, social media is the key because the mainstream media, as you mentioned, Al Jazeera and others are controlled by, by uh, the rulers. And they certainly determine what will be there and how it will be presented. Nevertheless, there is social media. 
And social media can be not only used by the enemy, it could be used by us. It's open channels to the Arab world. Thank you. Uh, what do you think of the Israeli military spokesperson um, who's often on TV, um, and I follow him on social media as well. Do you think he and the other representatives from Israel who speak are doing a good job? Do you think the Israeli ambassador to the UN um, is doing a good job? I thought it was very clever what he did this week of posting Yaya Sinwar's phone number, you know, for those who want to cease fire. You know, do you think those are the right representatives for Israel right now to sort of show our case? Or do you think we should have more people like the families of hostage victims or or murder victim speak who maybe have more of the emotional um, pull at, at viewers? Let me confess uh, about one of my personal mistakes. There are a few of them about this military spokesman. Um, in Haifa University, we teach also uh, officers from the army. And I was uh, lucky enough to have six of the Israeli spokespersons in the history as my students, some of them even became my friends. Uh, the only one who wasn't, there are two of them who weren't, but the only one who wasn't trained in communication, never took a communication course, never attended any communication class, was the present spokesperson for the Israeli army. So when he was nominated, and he came from the Navy commando, he was what we call Israeli SEALs. Okay, and he was uh, head of the Israeli commando, uh, Navy commander, I was thinking, and I was wrong, that he is not the right person. He has no conf no experience whatsoever in media. He never learned about anything about the media. And believe it or not, I was wrong. He is one of the best spokesperson we ever had, because he's honest, he's open, he's clear. He will never say anything which was not checked before. Is full of authority and authenticity, and I would say is reliable more than anything else. So in, in some ways, contrary to my expectations, it doesn't take, uh, to become a good spokesperson, you don't have to take my courses. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I will say that, that Haifa is unique in terms of our military college, which is, which is really wonderful. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I want to sort of ask with a closing question. Again, we have hundreds of questions, literally, that we're trying to get through in this conversation, and we will share this this recording afterwards, and maybe we'll have Dr. Weinman back again for another discussion since it's such a hot topic right now and probably for the future. Um, can you sort of trace the social media waves with real life consequences? Like, is there a direct correlation between the amount of anti-Israel posts and the virulence of those posts and what's going on in real um, life in terms of people ripping down posters or protesting on campuses or you know attacking Jewish businesses? Is there a direct link? Yeah, as I told you, we, we are doing studies about it because this is for us communication scholars, a real chance to monitor the effect of social media. And uh, it's quite, uh, and as I said, there are measures and there are scales to, to, to measure it. And the interesting finding, because we already are after two months of war, is the how vivid and dynamic is this uh, arena. Um, it is not flat. What I'm trying to say, it's not always Hamas is winning, Israel is losing, or Hamas was winning first and losing now. It's not like that. It's, it's changing and the, there are trends up and down uh, it's a roller coaster in a way. And it has to do with the events themselves. It has to do with the two sides, the two sides exchanging blows. And it also has to do with some um, su successful campaigns. Um, when the Palestinians came out uh, during the first ceasefire and, and showed the, the uh, destruction of Aza, they certainly scored well. And it could be seen on, on our uh, charts of positive or negative uh, reactions in social media. Nevertheless, the Israelis are, uh, are doing quite well themselves and, and presenting the families of the victims, um, showing people, even journalists, this horrible film, those 46, 45 minutes uh, movie, video done. Uh, again, people will see it, we react, we spread the I would say shock about it, 
in the media, in social media, in mainstream media, and so on. So there are waves, and um, it's going up and down. And um, I'm quite sure we are not over with it. I mean, the Israelis still <coughs> are fighting hard to win, not only on the ground, but also in the PR arena. Yeah. Um, and I will say, I know this chat has been very active as always, which I love seeing. Um, a lot of people want to have you back. So we hope to have you back. Um, feel free, of course, to follow Dr. Wyman across his social media. You can read his books, his papers, his articles, um, and that of his group. We can share that afterwards with all of you as well. Um, I know a lot of people have asked how they can get in touch with me or with ASUH. Just email info at ASUH.org, or you can email me and Reinhardt at ASUH.org. Um, a lot of people have mentioned in the chat too, there are some very brave and courageous people from the Arab world and from um, Gaza and elsewhere um, who are Palestinians, who are Arabs, who are Muslims, who are who are sharing the truth and are sharing their their stories. You know, the son of Hamas, this famous man who's been a, who's been everywhere lately, has been amazing, and Bassam Eid and and many others like them. Um, so there are. I don't want to say that it's all bad. You know, there's a lot of wonderful courageous people who are who are speaking out a lot of them then of course can't go back to their homes and get death threats and you know um get really attacked for doing what they're doing but they're doing wonderful important work sharing the truth on their platforms and and across you know college campuses and elsewhere so um again we're at the end of the hour thank you guys so much we have um a really wonderful audience who who loved hearing from you um this very very important topic um, we will um, continue to do these webinars um, as often as we're able right now every couple of weeks. Um, we likely can't do one at the end of December because it'll just be a difficult time of year, but we'll start again um, right away in, in January. Um, thank you again to Dr. Wyman for your unique insights and your time today, um, given how busy you are. Thank you to all of our viewers and listeners. Um, I want to thank once again our co-sponsors of this webinar, Rabbi Arthur Wiener and the JCC of Paramus and Congregation Beth Tikva. Um, for those of you who want to um, share your questions, um, who weren't able to, to get um, answered today, you can, in, you can email um, info at ASUH.org. Um, we will share a recording of this webinar um, in a few days um, with our entire um, database and our audience. We'll let you know about our next webinars as well. Um, lastly, thank you again to those who would like to support us through our Emergency Scholarship Fund for Reserve Soldiers. As you know, they're in desperate need at this time for financial and emotional um, support. Um, they're defending uh, the Jewish state and they need financial assistance to do so. Um, and also for those of you who'd like to support those who are staying in our dorms, who are evacuated from throughout the country, you can do so as well by donating to ASUH.org slash donates. Um, so please follow us on social media. Please follow our newsletters. Um, and for those who celebrate, please um, enjoy the rest of the Hanukkah um, holiday um, and the rest of the holiday season. So thank you again, Dr. Wyman, and thank you to all of our viewers, and uh, we'll see you very soon again. Take care, everyone.